Horus was the first of the Primarchs to be recovered. He was found on Chthonia merely three years after the Great Crusade commenced. All the records say so. And all the records lie. Or rather, it is fair to say that the records reflect what was understood to be true by those who compiled them. Do you really think my father, the Emperor, having lost his greatest creations to the wiles of his enemies, would have celebrated the rediscovery of the first so loudly and so triumphantly? Such a thing would be to invite attack once more, and my father might have lost the only Primarch he was ever destined to find. For good this time. No. My father was more cunning than that. I was a stroke of luck, a lone remnant of his great work recovered from the jaws of failure. Horus was the first indication that more of us might still live out in the wilds of the galaxy. And so the news of Horus' existence could be risked. He became the rallying point, the glorious hope of the burgeoning Imperium, apparently the first of the Emperor's sons to be found and destined to be the greatest and brightest of us all. That role of standard bearer is one I could never have fulfilled. I wonder how heavily that that responsibility sits on my brother's shoulders. I was present when several of my siblings were first met by our father. Often, in fact, disguised as members of their own legions. Lorgar never even blinked. He was so enraptured by the Emperor. The lion's instincts were sharper, and I could almost feel his sense that something was not as it seemed, but he never worked out what it was. Or if he did, he gave no indication. Then again, few of us are as inscrutable as the Lord of the First. It is one of the things I consider myself to have in common with him. I was not at Angron's discovery. And I do not regret that. Welcome one and all. I am Azazel, and for better or worse, you have stumbled your way onto my video detailing the scattering of the Primarchs in Warhammer 40k. While I usually, and in the future will aim to, use my own interpretations for an introduction, the beginning of this video was two short excerpts from Head of the Hydra by Mike Brooks. His writing style is rapidly becoming one of my favourites and I adore his works, so please make sure to read them for yourselves. What follows is an introduction to the scattering of the Primarchs, in my own words. Be prepared now. Steal your hearts and gird your minds as we enter the most horrific place imaginable. The place where hope goes to die, and where thirsting gods rack the souls of billions, while directing madness on the stage of our galaxy as easily as puppeteers pull on strings. Welcome to the 41st Millennium. Mankind has seen countless wars, eons of bloodshed and violence. Our golden age of technology which spanned the stars crumbled into pinpricks of scattered humanity fighting against the encroaching dark. Blood-soaked savagery and tempestuous power of the worst kinds ran rampant throughout our species. And in our darkest days, no world was like terror itself, our homeworld. Scientists of breathtaking intelligence, yet unrestricted by conscience or morals, had unlocked the secrets of the human genome. 
creating horrific mutated abominations that served warmongering despots as they carved out territory for themselves. Rabid psych tyrants channeled their malefic energies to overwhelm and destroy their contemporaries and create kingdoms. Techno-barbarian warlords salvaged what remained of humanity's knowledge to manufacture earth-splitting weapons that spread war across our continents. Only at the heights of the Horus Heresy did Terra exceed this abominable hellscape. But why am I telling you this? Because the situation matters. The circumstances dictate the actions, and it was in this, mankind's lowest point in millennia, that the Emperor revealed himself. With stolen power and gene tech knowledge garnered over millennia, he and several others crafted weapons that would shake the galaxy. The Primarchs. His Thunder Warriors, the Legio Contagious, were well suited for conquering Terra, this much is true. But they were a blunt weapon, a cudgel without thought, care, or precision. They were a monstrous weapon for a monstrous time. Yet to undergo a galactic crusade? They were ill-suited. His Legio Custodes were the pinnacles of scientific engineering, warriors without peer, trained to perfection, armed to the gills with powerful weaponry and pushing the limits of humanity's potential. Yet, due to the cost, time, and materials required for each one, they too were unsuited to be troops in a war across the stars. The Emperor needed something different, a new breed of super-soldiery. One that could be batch produced, adapt to different methodologies, and complement the skills of one another. He required warriors that could make war as an army, as a legion, and not simply as a mass of muscle and armor. He needed what would later be known as the Legiones Astartes. Yet what is the use of manifold transhuman armies without a general of superfluous might? What is a weapon without a wielder? He could not be everywhere at once, elevated beyond the state of normal humanity though he was. He needed his Primarchs. Stronger, faster, charismatic, more intelligent. Warriors without equal. Strategists to outfox his enemies, logisticians to build his empire, and stalwart defenders to build up those worlds conquered in his name. Twenty Primarchs, or twenty-one if you're going to be facetious about it. Twenty different genetic templates, twenty bodies of gene-forged magnificence, Twenty shining souls of whose potency and power were contained within human form. We will get into the whys and wherefores of how he achieved this at another time. Yet so it was that he and his lead geneticists formed these godlike beings in his gene labs deep in terror. As with any human, or at least human-like, beings, each needed to come to maturation in their own time. Twenty sets of incubator pods sat deep in the bowels of the earth. Small packages of incredible power. Beings that would change the feet of worlds and make the galaxy entire tremble once they came into their own. Yet, in the beginning they were little more than babies. In some cases, with a modicum of self-awareness, yet we little bairns nonetheless. Then the unthinkable happened. A warp storm ripped apart the labs. These young demigods were lost in the tides of the warp, unleashed into their fury of the Empyrean, lost through time and space. 
each, in their own way, would wash up on the planets of humanity. Colchis, Prospero, outposts of humanity lost among the outer dark. There they grew to maturity, both shaping and shaped by the events on those worlds. Most were brought up by adoptive parents or clans, others less so. However, each one would become a living symbol. Each one would bring glory, war and death to their worlds, and each one would be found by the Imperium as the Great Crusade pushed out among the stars. One by one, the Emperor would gather his lost sons about him and reunite the missing Primarchs with their lost gene sons, the Legiones Astartes. But what caused the scattering of the Primarchs? Who is to blame? In my mind, we have three pivotal players in the game. Three individuals who altered the course of the galaxy with this single act. But let's explore. Chaos. For 20 years, it was believed that chaos was the cause of the scattering. The chaos gods, both angry at the emperor for stealing their power on a planet named Molech, and concerned at him creating twenty loyal demigods of war, broke through the wardings around the infant Primarchs and snatched them up in a warp vortex. This scattering was designed not only to separate the Primarchs from the Emperor, and discourage the loyalty that sons would gain as they grew up with him, but also to alter and change the personalities of the Primarchs themselves. We see this in the book The First Heretic by Aaron Dembski Bowden. In the book, Argel Tal of the Word Bearers is taken for a wild ride with Ingethel the Ascended. In this, Argel Tal is either taken back in time or given an extraordinarily convincing VR version of the scattering of the Primarchs, wherein he himself strikes the blow that breaks the Gellerfields and allows Chaos to whisk away the infant Primarchs. Now, yes, there is an obvious paradox here. For Argel Tal to travel back in time and free the infant Primarchs, Lorgar would have already had to have ended up being whisked away to Colchis in a very much self-fulfilling prophecy for him. Luckily for Warhammer 40k, time doesn't exist in the warp. If something exists in the warp, it will always have existed in the warp. Doesn't make sense? You're right, it doesn't, and it's this kind of mind-bending shenanigans that not only give us great stories that can crisscross across time, but also gives writers a bit of leeway with story writing. Essentially, a get-out-of-jail-free card under the name of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey, warp fudgery. So this is option number one, with Chaos and Argel Tal being responsible. But now, on to option number two. Erda. A relatively new character in Warhammer 40k, and her reception has been... mixed to say the least. Erda was revealed in the Saturnine novel to be the mother of the Primarchs. She was, like the Emperor, a perpetual, a genius-level geneticist and a rare specimen of being. She adored the Emperor and throughout the millennia aided him in his vision for humanity. It was she who donated part of the genetic material necessary to create the Primarchs. She was every bit as invested and involved with their creation as the Emperor was, and yet we've never met her before this moment. And with good reason. Erda had a change of heart. Her beloved sons, her progeny, 
Her demigods that would be gifted with talents undreamed of for humanity were to be used by the Emperor for galactic conquest. Let's be honest, she should have seen that one coming. She feared the monsters the Emperor would make out of them, like savage warlords of old, and wished to spare them from this fate. In order to save them, she conjured a warp vortex and set her sons adrift on the tides of the Empyrean to live their lives on other worlds, far from the influence of their father. It was after this act of defiance that she fled. Before we get to our third potential player on the stage of blame, let us just compare these two contrasting points. On the one hand, we have words from Erda herself, her own recollection of events, emotions and actions that led to her betrayal. She straight up confesses to the act. This goes directly against the events of Argel Tal. During his experience, he was warned against experiencing strong emotion. Otherwise, the Emperor would detect him and strike him down before he could take down the Gellifields. Both of these events seem to have happened, yet directly contradictory. Although in Warhammer 40k it wouldn't be the first time that we had contradictory storylines, I would then propose a middle ground to settle these two points. A compromise, if you will. It is difficult indeed for demons and demonic powers to cross the threshold to our realm unaided. They are almost always summoned by psychers in our reality. Therefore, I propose that Erda did not summon a warp vortex at all. Instead, she unwittingly summoned Ingathel and Argel Tar. Even as she broke the barrier between worlds, she merely extended a hand, and Chaos grasped it. Using Erda's power as a beacon, they breached the barrier between worlds and acted. In this way, both Chaos is responsible for the scattering of the Primarchs, and Erda is instrumental in making it happen, yet does not necessarily have the full knowledge of what transpired. In this way, Chaos's plan still comes to fruition. However, even this didn't go exactly according to their designs as somehow some of the infant Primarchs ended up on different planets to those designated. This fact, coupled with the knowledge that the Emperor did not immediately hunt down and kill Erda for betraying him, brings a third option into play. What if the Emperor planned the scattering of the Primarchs? Now, the Emperor fails to win Father of the Year many times in Warhammer 40k, but letting his godlike, gene crafted generals of incredible power fall out of his hands across the galaxy? It seems like a daft thing to do, akin to dumping your prized possessions all across the world and saying, It's fine, I'll grab them when I need them. And yet. In the novel Valdor, we experience the scattering of the Primarchs from another perspective, that of Valdor and Malkador racing to the gene labs as the destruction from the warp vortex dissipates. There, they discover the facility broken, burning, and verging on ruins. All that prevents the total collapse is the power of the Emperor, straining to contain the damage and grant the survivors time to escape. The Emperor was in the epicenter of the entire event, and yet either was unable to, or chose not to prevent it. Coincidence? For the sake of this video, let us assume not. Join me as we speculate on a darker side of the Lord of Humanity, and his machinations for galactic power. Tell me, brother. I'm curious, are you one of those who believe our scattering was chance, or one of those who do not? I think Gilliman is in the latter camp. I can see the thought taking round the tedious track of a mind he has, like a rodent in a maze, 
desperate to find a different way out. But knowing there is only one exit and a feline waits without. Tick. 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 <laughs> Does my purpose matter? Come, Angel. Do you really think it was a chance? I want to know. Each one of us was cast away upon a world that turned out to suit our characteristics perfectly. Characters our father engineered. Furthermore, the characters of many of our Legion's Terran sons were also matched with those of the world we were found upon. And, oh yes, we can both see the future. I rather suspect therefore father can read it like a periodical. Can you stand there and tell me it was chance? Reason number one. Tempering. The Emperor, insofar as this scenario is concerned, required weapons of war, not sons. To raise, teach, and guide twenty demigods is a chore, but what better way to prepare them for their roles as generals than to let them fend for themselves? To drop his creations across the galaxy and send them out into horrors unimaginable. Once their time of rediscovery came about, the Emperor's sons would be battle-hardened warriors, blood-soaked revolutionaries and warrior kings. He would have weapons well disposed to the hardships of war, without the need to raise them. Reason number two. Galactic Empire. With full confidence in his weapons, galactic unification would become far easier. It was a gamble, yes, yet his Primarchs contained boundless potential and frightening power. If they could carve out miniature empires by themselves before he arrived to claim them, it would ease the passage of the Great Crusade by centuries. Consider that both Rogal, Dawn, and Gilliman were heads of their own interstellar empires by the time they were reunited with one another. That is hundreds of worlds brought under the Emperor's domain without the grueling warfare, carnage, and blood price of conquest. Reason number three, a deal with chaos. As mentioned earlier, the Emperor's deal with chaos on Molech is highly mysterious. Was it for the power that he supposedly stole from the gods? If that power was not stolen and merely traded, then what was the price determined? Could it be that the scattering of the Primarchs was part of the deal he brokered with chaos? We will cover this reason in a larger entry that is in the works in the future, so I'll move on from it now, but it is merely some food for thought. So there we have it, our three antagonists. Our three suspects for the scattering of the Primarchs. Chaos, via Argel Tal, Erda, and the Emperor himself. And yet there is more to consider. Each of these theories leaves something to be desired, some missing piece of the puzzle which we may never receive as Games Workshop does adore a good mystery. So I would, therefore, put together my own picture from this jigsaw jumble. The Emperor knew of the possibility of the scattering. He was blessed with vast precognitive abilities, he could read a number of futures, examine the odds of success with each one, and take steps to ensure that he had the best advantage. So what if the scattering of the Primarchs was the best step for the Great Crusade, or at least the lesser evil? Time was always his greatest enemy. The Chaos Gods were rousing themselves, preparing for a feast of humanity. Mankind was not yet ready as a species, 
So he did indeed understand the need to both temper his Primarchs and gain footholds across the galaxy under the guise of his scattered Primarchs fiefdoms. Perhaps raising them on terror led to a future where the Imperium of Man simply failed to grow large enough to sustain itself within the time parameters. With this knowledge, he alienated Erda. He turned her against himself, fully aware of the warp vortex that would be summoned. He already knew that chaos would whisk them away across the galaxy. Yet he would turn it in his favor. He was with the infant Primarchs at the moment of the scattering. His presence would be the last presence they felt before they were whisked away on the etheric currents. And in many cases, they remembered him. His psychic and emotional imprint on these demigods would last the decade and enable him to better reconnect with his sons once they met once more. Not only this, but Magnus revealed that Jagatai and Fulgrim were supposed to land on each other's planets, yet some galactic force prevented this from happening. It is not specified whether it was by the will of the gods of chaos, but in the absence of any other evidence, I propose that it was the Emperor who used his not insignificant psychic power to manage this. Perhaps it was not a definite possibility, more of a tip-the-odds-in-his-balance move, yet it adds to the theory. The scattering of the Primarchs was a galactic game-changer, yet it was something that was always going to happen. Chaos desired to separate them from the Emperor. Erda desired to save them from war. The Emperor needed them to be tested and become champions of the galaxy. All parties had a vested interest in this one event. The only thing they could do was tip the odds in their own favour. In a giant game of regicide, each one playing seven steps ahead of the others. So who succeeded the most? Which interested party gained the most out of their activities? Does a 50-50 split of Primarchs equal a draw? Does Horus striking down the Emperor count as a win for Chaos? Or does our God Emperor's apotheosis to the Divine indicate a win for humanity? In the grim darkness of the far future, there are no winners. There is only darkness. There is only death. There is only war. Thank you for joining me. If you're still here, I do hope I've made an improvement on the last couple of videos. The learning curve I am experiencing is steep, yet I hope to create enjoyable videos for those of you who, like me, love the lore of Warhammer 40k. I'd also like to apologize for the delay. I originally attempted a larger entry, one to be my piece de resistance onto the scene. Unfortunately, like Icarus, I reached too far too soon, so that one is still in the works, but I do hope to share it with you soon. Feel free to like, subscribe, comment something, anything you want me to touch upon more. Perhaps I need to adjust my approach in future videos, your input is welcomed as, well, without you, no one would be listening. Anywho, enjoy your day or night, and I hope you've indulged in some escapism from reality. For that's why we are here, isn't it? Until next time.